Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is all about the adjustments that we continue to have to make as we deal with the whole empty nest thing. If this is your first episode of Women in the Middle, I am so glad you found the podcast. Welcome. Women in the Middle is about actionable life coaching for women in their 50s designed to help with career boredom, career change, midlife crisis, transition, and empty nest issues, all from a mindfulness perspective. The other thing is that I like to infuse each episode with a bit of humor, and some episodes are a little more humorous than others. Midlife hilarity, if you will. And that, my friend, is how we're kicking things off today. Okay, ladies, here we go. As a woman in the middle... You have to stay on your toes. Bob and weave. Constantly question yourself as you navigate relationships with adult children. What's too much? What's too little? What's a reasonable communication expectation? What does independence really mean when they aren't at all financially independent? How do you handle expectations of household chores when they come home for the summer or the weekend or for March break for that matter? What about curfews and all the talking that you need to do about the middle of the night comings and goings when they're home? How comfortable do you feel when they're in the kitchen cooking a lot all of a sudden? They weren't cooking before they went away to school and got their first apartment. Are they doing the dishes? Are they cleaning up to your satisfaction? Do they know how to use your higher-end appliances, not the crap they're using in school? What about the cookware? Can they handle your glass, like your stove cooktop, without breaking it? (laughs) And the list goes on. But before we go into some of these things, I can't help but share with you something that's going on right here, right now in our house. It really surprised us. We didn't see it coming at all, but it happened. And it's a reminder to always expect the unexpected in midlife. Now, I've talked to you about that before in earlier podcast episodes, but here it is again. Always expect the unexpected in midlife. So my amazing women in the middle, my kids' pet lizards died while my kid was away at school. Crested geckos, actually. Not one, both of them. A breeding pair. He had these lizards for about eight years. Now, has this happened to you? Not the lizard part, but the death of your kid's pets while they're away. And I'm not talking about a family pet, necessarily. I am talking about one of my kid's actual pets. Daphne and Rocky, the crested geckos. They lived in a beautifully appointed large reptile tank in my son's room. They were well cared for too. Like we really spared no expense when it came to these lizards. My son tried to sell them before he left for school, but only he only tried with family and friends and he didn't get anywhere. He wasn't able to rehome them. So my husband and I just assumed the responsibility for their care. We even paid for pet sitting while we were away on vacation. Wherever the bird goes, the lizards went. We are fortunate to find this woman who enjoys caring for critters. So she takes them in. The dog, we were also fortunate to find this woman who knows how to manage and handle a Newfoundland and enjoys it. So our Newf goes to the woman who can handle him and the reptiles and the bird go to the woman who can handle them. But one night, a few weeks ago, my husband was getting ready for bed and went in to spritz them with water and feed them their vegetable mush, which we did every day. Something didn't look right. The next thing I knew, he was standing in front of me. I was in the office. He was standing there looking bewildered and white as a ghost, telling me that both of the lizards were dead. Now, how weird is that? They were meant to live much longer than this. Like, they were eight. They were supposed to live 15, 20 years, I think. Immediately, we texted my son and we said, can we give you a call? Something weird happened. And We told him, and we were just all just shocked. We started Googling things that we might have done wrong. Oh, my God, could something we have done while caring for them actually killed them? We felt sick, but we couldn't think of anything. We kept saying, well, nothing's changed. After searching online 
Fortunately, we couldn't find anything that we did wrong. So I guess they got sick. I mean, that would make sense if they both got sick. Maybe they both got sick from the same thing. The only thing I could think of was that it was particularly cold when we traveled back and forth to the pet sitters on our last vacation while we were away. And I'm suspicious of that, even though I totally went out of my way to keep things warm in the car. I was worried about the bird and the lizards. We kept the car running. One of us stayed in the car while we went back and forth to pick up the pets. But it was particularly cold, so I don't know. Anyway, it's a mystery. We felt horrible about the whole thing. We really went above and beyond for these lizards. They came back and forth to the family cottage with us. Like any time we went away, if the bird went, the lizards went. They had the best of everything. And having to tell our son was horrible too. The triad of horrible was complete by the way we felt about questioning our actions. We felt horrible that there was a chance that perhaps we did something wrong. So the the pet died while the kid was away. We had to tell the kid. We were worried that we did something wrong. And now, now I have two dead lizards in my freezer waiting for my son to decide what he wants to do with them. I gave my husband the job of wrapping the lizards and putting them there. And I told him to tell me where they were so I didn't accidentally pull them out and defrost them by mistake. Can you imagine? So it's been a few weeks, and I went into that freezer the other day to put something inside. It was the freezer in the basement, and I wondered, where exactly did he put them? I just couldn't deal with it the night they died, and I checked all of the shelves. I couldn't see anything that looked different. I turned my head to the right to check the door. They were there. Not wrapped very well, either. I could see a body part through the paper towel and through the clear plastic Ziploc container. Well. At least I know where they are now. (laughs) I'm not going to mistake it for hamburger. Oh my God, I felt like a little kid. I knew they were dead. I knew they were in the freezer, but I didn't want to go see them. And I was expecting them to be fully wrapped. (laughs) And they weren't. I just wanted to close my eyes on the whole reptile scenario. As you can imagine, I'm sure. Actually, we have a long history with reptiles that started way back in 2005 when we took our first family trip to Disney World in Florida. We unknowingly transported a small house gecko in a backpack all the way back to Toronto. We created a beautiful ecosystem for her, and before you knew it, she laid eggs, which hatched, and her babies laid eggs, which also hatched, and then these five house geckos lived happily in that aquarium for nine years. No mate, though. Apparently, house geckos are all about parthenogenesis, and you don't need a mate to lay eggs. What a surprise that was. I was looking in the tank one day, and... I'm like, oh my God, there's baby lizards. My husband's yelling at me. He's like, they're crickets. <laughs> no, they're not. I've been feeding these things for months. I know the difference between a cricket and a baby gecko. Anyway, that whole thing was a surprise and that went on for a long time. But it wasn't quite the same scenario for Daphne and Rocky. May they rest in peace. Now, they had a fair bit of sex. No parthenogenesis for them. We saw them having sex. Um, They were a breeding pair, and my son raised two rounds of babies and sold them to a local reptile store. And I have to tell you, it was completely fascinating and so much fun to watch this whole thing, watch them laying eggs, learning about incubation, watching them hatch, and then taking care of the babies. It really was something that my son really enjoyed it. Oh, well, that phase is over. It's funny, a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog called Lizard Love, Older Sons, and Me, where I talk about babysitting lizards. It's been going on for years, really, like I said, with the whole Disney World thing, and I had to take care of them every summer when the kids were away for two months at camp. And I can pick out the faint but recognizable odor of reptile keeping with ease. There is a faint odor. I don't know what it comes from. I don't know if it's from misting them with water. I don't know if it's the lizard poop. I don't know. But any of you women in the middle out there who have reptiles in your home as pets will know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) So the lizard phase, as sad as it is, really is a phase that's over. But the empty nest phase is not. And my youngest kid left for um, his first year this year, but we still had his pets. Um, So my nest still had two lizards in it. (laughs) The middle kid is at school and the oldest kid graduated and came back for a year off in between. Now the empty nest phase 
is rarely quick. There's a lot of toing and froing, and it barely looks like anyone left around here. In fact, this week my youngest decided that he wasn't even going to bring his laundry home with him because he had enough clothing still at home. So it takes more than a couple of years for empty nest transition to be complete. My informal analysis of my friend's kids, who are a little ahead of us, suggests that this will probably go on for eight years or so. I say, totally fine with me, but it does bring up the topic of independence, real and imagined. This is the topic that I think needs careful attention. Walk carefully or hear an earful. What does independence really mean? Is it when they live most days of the year without you? Or is it when they can stand on their own two feet financially? Can you be truly independent with one but not the other? I'm really not sure. There's often a disconnect between what we, the parents, make independence mean and what your kid makes it mean. Therein lies the potential problem. The topic of responsibility is a big one, too. They can tend to treat your house like a hotel when they don't live there full time. But that's just not right. They still have responsibilities. When did the rule about not leaving the dishes in the sink change? I didn't get that memo. And why are they cooking for themselves with no consideration for meal planning? All of a sudden, there are extra kids for dinner with no mention of it. And as if they've adopted a way of daily life in their, in their apartments and houses and they think that the same rules apply when they come home. This, of course, needed to be discussed. I love their friends and I say yes to having them stay for dinner 9.5, 9.75 times out of 10. But I want to be asked first, right? I also love when they're home. But when they're home, I want them to remember that they have to ask, they have to check in, they have to clear things first. The vast majority of things they want to do get full support. But there's some coordination involved. I have a home-based business after all. And as many of you know, I record this podcast in the Cedar Closet, which is only steps away from the kid room with the big TV and all of the gaming equipment, and only another 20 feet from the pool table and the drum set. These are issues when you're trying to record a podcast. In fact, I think I hear somebody now. They are home for spring break. Boom. <laughs> I don't know what that was. The reason I'm sharing all of this with you today, dead lizards and all, is because mindfulness strategies are the key to happiness. It's crucial to key into your thoughts and feelings when it comes to parenting adult kids. The transition from pre-empty nest to partially empty nest to changing empty nest to truly empty nest takes years. So you have time to see what you're thinking and to decide if you like the way it feels. If those thoughts and feelings aren't useful for you, then, my amazing women in the middle, you have options. When you understand that your thoughts are just sentences in your mind and that you can watch them stream by, you are empowered. When you understand that you don't need to be at the effect of your feelings when it comes to your kids and all of the frustrating things that they do, that you can be more intentional. You are empowered. So my advice really is to treat this transition the same way you treat other midlife transitions, with care, compassion, fascination, and unconditional love, rather than frustration, annoyance, impatience, and conditional love. The key to this shift really is to be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of your feelings and slow down. Create more pauses in your life. Shift perspective from the 20 years or so of parenting experience that you have to the gradual appreciation that you're now parenting adult children and you'll both have different needs and wants. And as my mom always taught me, there's a big difference between needs and wants. Decide what's really important to you. You can do what you want, your kid, your house, but you just have to like your reasons and make sure you understand what you're really thinking and how it's making you feel. Your kid who's leaving the dishes in the sink isn't making you feel annoyed. Your kid who doesn't fill up the gas after the weekend borrowing the car isn't making you aggravated. Your kid coming home at 3 a.m. while home on spring break isn't the problem. You are making yourself annoyed and aggravated with your thoughts, with your thinking. They might go something like this. It's so disrespectful to come home and not clean up after yourself. Or, what a spoiled brat to think that he can use the car and not replace the gas. Or, she's being so selfish when she comes home at three in the morning knowing full well we have to go to work tomorrow. 
These thoughts are what's creating your feelings. You get to decide if you like your reasons for feeling the way you do or not. If you do, fine. Work on communication. Recognize that you can't control other people's behavior. You can state what you want, right? You can impose a consequence when it has to do with your belongings like the car, but you can't control somebody else's behavior. If you don't like your reasons, decide how you want to feel and think accordingly. Choosing to be fascinated works wonders. You could be fascinated. Try this one. If your kid doesn't think to refill the tank, could you be fascinated with that? It's curious, right? When you're fascinated, you're rarely aggravated. Or you rarely feel like a bad parent because you raised a spoiled brat. When you communicate from a place of fascination rather than aggravation, your approach will be completely different. What you do will create your personal result every time. So think about it. Could you be open to the idea that your kid is learning more about your needs with this transition? Could you think that you're learning every day how to parent your adult kid? Could you be wrong that your kid is a spoiled brat? Could you be open to the idea that you're an amazing parent? Could you think that your kid is still growing and learning? And my favorite, could you be fascinated with how your kid is handling his or her transition into fully leaving your nest? Pretty good, right? These thoughts have the potential to create a lot more happiness for you as you navigate your nest. That's it for this episode. If you like what you've heard, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. I can't even tell you how much I appreciate that. Also, if you haven't done so yet, make sure to grab my freebie, 10 Surprising Ways to Bust Out of Your Midlife Funk, www.susierosenstein.com forward slash midlife funk. Check out the show notes with more information and links at www.susierosenstein.com. Let's do this, ladies. One empty nest related thought at a time. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.